Hi everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Using the Fire Mapping Tool to Map Fires. This is the first of two webinars that we'll be holding on techniques for wildfire detection. We are very happy to present Josh Picot, who will be our guest speaker for today, talking about his fire mapping tool. Before we get started, though, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how this course is structured. There will be two two-hour sessions, one this week and one next week on Thursday. Session A will be 10 to 12 Eastern Time, and session B for each week is 6 to 8 p.m. Um, Eastern Time. You only need to attend one of these sessions because they are exactly the same. Again, our guest speaker this week will be Josh Picot with the USGS. Um, he will also be on the end of the second week to answer any questions you might have about the fire mapping tool. All our recordings, the PowerPoint presentations, and the homework assignments can be found after each session at our website listed here. And then following each lecture and each exercise, we will be available for Q&A, or you can email me or my colleague, Amber McCollum, at my e email address listed here. There will be one homework assignment at the end of the second session next week. The answers must be submitted um, via Google Forms. In addition, you can get a certificate of completion, but you have to attend both live sessions from both weeks and complete the homework assignment by August 2nd. You'll receive certificates approximately two months after the completion of the course. There are several prerequisites for this course since it is an advanced course. First, you have to take Fundamentals of Remote Sensing, Session 1 and 2A. Um, you can get that again on our webinar, and you can look at it anytime you want. It's an on-demand webinar. It's also very important, um, hopefully you've all already done this, download and install QGIS and in all accompanying software. Um, we have an exercise available to help you with that called downloading and installing QGIS. So again, hopefully you have all done that before you've um, attended this webinar today. And we also strongly recommend that you actually open um, QGIS if you haven't used it before to make sure that the software is working properly. Again, to access course materials, you can go to our website listed here. Um, you'll see the registration information, the course agenda, um, and details about each of the sessions, as well as access to uh, the homework and the exercises. So the overall outline is this week, session one, um, Josh will be giving an overview of the QGIS fire mapping tool. And then next week, we'll be focusing on the Global Wildfire Information System, or GWIS. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Josh. So hold, bear with us for a minute while we switch screens. All right, so thank you very much for the introduction, Cindy. Um, to start this presentation, I'd really like to thank USGS uh, Earth Resources and Observation Science Data Center in Chappelle, South Dakota, um, for making a lot of this possible. Um, I was originally based out of there. I'm uh, in Chappelle, South Dakota. I am now teleworking out of Los Angeles, but I'm still working with Eros. Um, I'd also really like to thank the retired project lead, Stephen Howard. Um, who really did most of the program, uh, did most of the management of this project and who got a lot of this project started. And I'd also like to sh thank the tool developer, Cheryl Holen and Kartik Badamali. Kartik was the original developer and um, Cheryl has since taken over from him. So, and they've, they've done a great job on the uh, fire mapping tool. And finally, I'd like to thank the NASA Applied Sciences Program Wildfires Project NN H12 AU711 um, because NASA funded the majority of this project, although uh, my sense of burn severity has since taken over the funding um, from NASA. So today we're going to start off with a little bit of background on burn severity and how we actually measure this using remote sensing methods. 
We'll also talk about Landsat and how Landsat imagery feeds into the whole burn mapping process. And then we'll talk about um, some image pairing considerations when picking a pre and a post fire image. Um, and finally, we'll act I'll actually introduce the um, QGIS fire mapping tool. So to start, I'm going to give you a few basic definitions to kind of explain burn severity. So we're going to start with fire intensity, which is the amount of heat release per unit of time or area. Um, and so basically, that's important because fire intensity directly impacts burn severity. Um, burn severity is the actual effect on the ecosystem properties. Um, it's often defined by the degree of mortality vegetation. It can also be the degree of damage to the soils as well. So loosely, fire burn severity is a product of fire intensity and uh, residence time, so how long the fire has been on the ground. Um, soil burn severity, the actual fire induced changes that change both the chemical, um, physical, and biological properties of the soil, um, and that generally impact hydrologic and, hydrologic and biological soil functions. Um, so just to give you a really nice pictorial example of fire intensity versus burn severity, again, fire intensity is the amount of heat, it's, it's the, it's the um, how hot the fire gets that resu result in vegetation damage. And again, uh, I should also say it results in also soil burn severity damage as well. So from a field perspective, there's ways to assess burn severity on the ground. One is Key and Benson's Composite Burn Index, and what this does is it does a visual estimate um, of actual damage to the vegetation, the soil. Uh, generally, researchers hike through and observe burn <clears throat> scholars and then rate the actual amount of severity. There's also ways to assess from the soil uh, burn severity metrics, including um, water repellency tests, so seeing how long it takes for the water to infiltrate the soil, and just some visual tests, so how do the soils change in color. And from a satellite perspective, we can also see burn severity. On the left, you can see a landsat image that shows a fairly recent fire scar that generally crosses um, grasslands and shrub areas and gets a little bit into the forested areas in the center of the image right here. And we can directly correlate this with on the ground measurements to then threshold the imagery to get a burn severity map. And so this burn severity map, we'll see some more of these throughout the presentation. Um, dark green is, the un is unburned, mint green is low severity, uh, yellow is moderate severity, and red is high severity. And so if we want to kind of relate the two, we actually can look at the imagery and relate it to what's what's going on, on the ground. So were trees killed? Um, is there any remaining vegetation? Um, if it's been a little bit time after the fire, can we actually see areas of regrowth? Um, if it's been a long time after the fire, are there areas that have since um, that have since shown some more tree damage, such as tree dieback or some um, delayed mortality. So when we talk about remote sensing electromagnetic energy, we're talking about measuring how light reflects off the ground um, in different spectra. And by measuring these uh, spectral response curves, we can identify the type of vegetation that's on the ground, or um, in this case, the amount of burn severity. And this is due to the different, again, spectral response curves um, in the different um, electromagnetic energy spectra. So the spectral response, there's different peaks within the spectral response curves. Um, so for example, in the visual spectra, you can see one spectral response curve that is uh, results because of chlorophyll pigmentation. There's also a spectral <coughs> a peak um, in the mid-infrared um, because of healthy plant cells and how, they, how energy reflects off of them. And then finally, there's two additional peaks um, that are in the mid-infrared that are due to water absorption in healthy plant cells. 
In order to exploit these curves, we can see the difference between healthy vegetation and burn severity. And so if you look uh, towards the mid-IR, you start to see peaks that differ in intensity um, at the low, moderate, and high. So when we start thinking about what satellites we're going to use, we take into consideration several factors. The first factor is resolution. So how small of an object can we actually see? Uh, and this differs dramatically between different sensors. Some are going to have much coarser resolution, and this means the pixels are much larger as compared to some that have very fine resolution. The extent of the image. So can we actually see the entire fire sky in one image, or would it take several images? Um, that would need to be mosaic together to be able to see the fire scar. Um, revisit time. How often can we see the same area? And this really is important because in some areas, especially areas that get a large amount of clouds, we may not be able to get many images per year that are really that useful. And so if the re revisit time is infrequent, we may not get usable energy for much of the year, or we may not only get one or two images per year. And finally, spectral sensitivity. So we talked about the uh, spectral response curve, and there's different peaks depending on what you're looking at. So how many colors can we actually see, and what what areas of the um, electroman electromagnetic spectrum do they actually occupy? So the sensor we'll be dealing with today is Landsat. Um, we'll be specifically dealing with Landsat 5, thematic mapper, um, whose lifespan uh, basically around for 30 years, between 1984 and 2011. Um, and TM imagery has seven bands. Landsat 7 has been around from 1999 to present. However, I will say after 2003, it has data gaps in it. Um, and so it's not as complete as Landsat 5. And Landsat 7, or the Enhanced thematic Mapper, has eight bands. And finally, the newest sensor, which came online in 2013, is Landsat 8 Operational Land Imager. Um, it has 11 bands. All these sensors have 30 meter resolution in the electromagnetic band. And if you look at this graph over here, what you can see is that, for the most part, each sensor overlaps with one another. Um, again, OLI has more bands than Landsat 5, and um, Landsat 5 and 7 are actually more similar. Um, in the bands that they, they monitor, but they're still similar enough to be able to do um, the same types of mathematical operations to assess burn severity. So for burn severity mapping, um, a lot of the image processing map methods depend on what sensors you use. Again, for this application, we're going to use Landsat data. We could also use Sentinel data. However, at this time, the tool we'll be discussing in a few minutes um, is not set up to work with that data set. One thing that we do is we calculate the um, normalized burn ratio um, for an image, which is just the difference between the near infrared and short wave infrared divided by the sum. And from these, um, if we get a pre fire image, a pre fire image is usually taken during the same season as the fire. It can be in the same year as fire, or it could be one year previously. And if you look at this image, you don't see any fire scars in the middle right here. And if we calculate the MBR, what you'll see is just a lot of pixelation. You'll see uh, brighter pixels showing healthy vegetation, darker pixels showing less vegetated areas. As compared to the post fire imagery, in which you can see, clearly see a fire scar. And then these normalized burn ratio values, in this case, burned areas show up as more negative values. The higher the burn area, the more negative the value generally. Or Values are not always negative, but the, basically the values range from 1,000 to negative 1,000. So the lower the value, the potentially the higher burn severity. And so if we difference these two, which is just subtracting, um, excuse me, the uh, pre from the post fire, what we get is we get a difference image in which higher values show um, higher, higher potential change between the images. And so if you look around the fire scar, value should be low. Generally, if, if it's a perfect uh, image composite, if there's no phenologic changes between the vegetation, if the sun angle is exactly the same, 
you would see values generally around zero um, around the outside of the fire scar. Within the fire scar, um, again, higher values are these brighter pixels um, that may, be, may result in higher burn severity. And in this case, less vegetation, potentially more soil exposure. Um, so you can then take these images and actually threshold them. So if you know what the, um, how the imagery corresponds to the on the ground burn severity, you can then subsequently threshold it into uh, the unburned areas, which are these dark green values, the low severity, which are these mint green values, uh, yellow, which is moderate, and red, which is high. A variant of the different sunrise burn ratio is the relativized different sunrise burn ratio. Um, and this was developed by Miller and Thode in 2007. And basically what it does is it tries to account for differences in vegetation um, between areas so that you've got low versus high vegetation cover. Um, and so it measures relative change um, of vegetation in regards to the pixels. You could have a really an area of high vegetation, which is going to get a lot of change. And so both DMBR and RDBR are the same values. Kind of a moderate, again, where you can see DMBR and RDBR are similar threshold values. Once you get the lower canopy cover, sometimes the values are very different. And so RDBR can be used to um, better predict DMBR. Now, I should say that there's um, other research that shows RDMDR is not always effective, and it's definitely not effective in all vegetation types and may not be effective for your area. But it is a commonly used way within the United States to um, assess burn severity, in addition to the different sunlight burn ratio. So when we start thinking about what uh, the time frame from which we're going to obtain our pre-fire versus our post-fire image, we have to think about couple of things. The first thing is especially um, whether we want to do an initial or an extended assessment. Um, an initial assessment is done during the same year and generally the same season as when the fire occurred. So for example, if this fire occurred um, in August, we'd like to get a post-fire image in October. Um, as close to the fire as we can once the fire is out, um, And we would like to obtain a pre-fire image during the same season, generally the year before. Now, if there was an image available in July, it was especially very similar to the post-fire image. Um, I mean, in terms of areas that have not burned, we could also get one that it just has to be during the same time frame as the post-fire image. Um, an extended assessment is generally one year post-fire. Um, during the same season of burn, or actually it's generally more or less um, obtained during the peak of green during the subsequent season. Um, and so that we would therefore get a pre-fire image again during the same time frame. It could be the same year as the fire, or it could be back another year. But generally we have about a year between the pre and the, uh, pre and the post for extended assessments as well. And ex extended assessments start to measure delayed mortality, and also things like whether an area is trying to regenerate. And so depending on why you want to uh, do the assessment, you may have to choose between doing initial or extended. You may want to do an initial if your area um, ha is really highly vegetated and responds quickly, and therefore the fire scar will disappear very quickly, making kind of an extended assessment useless. Um, but you may want to do an extended uh, assessment if your area doesn't recover very quickly, or you actually want to see some of the recovery and assess areas that have not recovered. So it kind of depends on what you want to use it for. So again, initial assessment is generally done during the same um, time frame as uh, the actual fire. So in this image, you can see kind of a fire scar. It's kind of hard to pick out. It's a shrub area. Uh, it's got less. Uh, it's harder to differentiate with the fire scar within within this. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Within this reflectance image. As compared to a normalized burn ratio image, um, compiled from the same reflectance image, in which you can see the fire scar very clearly. And you can delineate these brighter values or areas where it potentially burned, potentially burned or removed more vegetation. Again, it's, it's still a little bit difficult to see just because the, of the size sparseness of the strong vegetation. An extended assessment 
again, would be one year post fire. And so what you're starting to see are these areas of green up or vegetation regeneration. And so when you look at the normalized burn ratio image, you see these darker values uh, more <clears throat> in which uh, in which we can see that the vegetation is regrowing and that they're, again, that they're uh, much darker spectrally than the rest of the fire scar. In fact, in this one, it's kind of difficult to even pick out the fire scar. So in this area, you might not want to do an extended assessment. Again, it would depend on what your objective is. Um, or doing the burn severity assessment in the first place. Um, another consideration is um, the Landsat scene pair. So we want to make sure that we have good pre and post fire image um, scene pairs for the DMBR image. So in this example, let me just go back and forth. Um, in the first image, you can't see a fire scar. When you compare it to the second image, Kind of the areas of unburned areas look very spectrally similar, at least visually sim similar, um, and you can see the fire scar very nicely. Now, one thing to take into account is you can see these shadows, and so those are going to show up in the DMDR image or clouds. So you have to be careful with that. So again, you can see the fire scar, but you can also see these artifacts. Luckily, these cloud and cloud shadow artifacts are not within the fire scar. They're not really um, impeding it at all. Um, you also want to make sure that there's limited between scene seasonal variation. And one way to measure this is by looking at normalized difference vegetation index uh, values um, per vegetation type over the fire scar. Um, you can do this by creating normalized difference vegetation index um, image yourself, or if you're within the contemporary US, right now on the uh, MTBS website, there's actually a page that um, you can actually look at the kind of the overall scene and DVI values. And so what you want to do, again, NDVI is kind of a measure of greenness. So the higher the value, the uh, greener the um, the pixel. If we compare, for example, these um, two time frames, one from um, March 31st, 2010, and the second one from April 16th, 2010, what you can see is the value is, relatively different. You can see a positive slope. And this is because when you actually look at the imagery, you can see you're going between a time of senescent, that's the left hand image in March, to a period of rapid green up. And so you gain this really big change between scenes. And so in this case, you'd want to make sure that if you're monitoring a fire in this area, that you picked a scene where the pre and the post matched up phenologically. And again, um, NDVI values can kind of show how green, on average, the scene is. And again, you also want to be careful if you're looking between years for the difference. So in this example, for 2009-2010, if you look around in January, and this is in the panhandle of Florida, what you can see is that the NDVI values are very similar, and so there's almost no difference between them. So these would be good scene pairs. However, if you look at these um, seen pairs after July, what you start to see is, um, I shouldn't say July, probably there's a difference in uh, phenology. And what you can see, the 2009 scene is much greener than the 2010 scene. It has, and this is only a difference of about uh, negative 0.04 between uh, NDVI values between the two. And so these two scenes probably would not, are probably not useful um, for uh, difference in to create different normalized burn ratio um, image just because of the difference in um, phenology between the two. Another thing to be careful of are differences between, um, I should say, between image land cover changes. So in this image, you can see these higher um, DMBR values, and these result from agriculture. If you have areas of agriculture in your fire scar, they may show up as high severity or low severity, they, they may alter the, um, again, severity. So you do not want them within your scene. Areas of development or land clearing or potentially like a timber harvest post fire also react, uh, also result in changes to the different normalized burn ratio values. So you have to be careful with these to make sure they're not within your fire perimeter. Another thing to take into account is that a fire that burned the year before may be regrowing, so you get these darker values, these darker, um, you get actual vegetation recovery. And so you want to make sure that there's not a lot of vegetation recovery in your fire scar 
again, unless that's your uh, unless that's an objective um, in an expected assessment. So these fire scars right here, you just want to make sure that these potential problems do not occur within them. The other thing you want to make sure is you actually understand where the fire occurred. So there's multiple fires here. It probably didn't occur on the same day. So it's nice to know exactly when each fire burned when it did. You also want to make sure that each image, so the um, pre and the post have similar reflectance brightness. So you can look at the, for example, on this one you can see that the left-hand image um, is much brighter than the second image, and this is because it's got a higher solar elevation, lower um, sun azimuth, and so you can see a brighter image. Um, again, this one is very different uh, because of sun elevation and sun azimuth angles. Also, the image on the right still has snow, so they're taken from, you can see that in kind of the blue coloration throughout the landscape. So you can see these two images really don't match up well at all um, for image pairing. And same thing for this one. This image you can see in areas probably either spring or you know being close to the peak of green versus one taken um, in the dormant season, where again there's a big difference in elevation and sun azimuth angles. So post fire and pre fire landsat scenes should also not have clouds within them, they should be cloud free. Um, this is because clouds really can obscure the burn severity value and really change um, uh, some of your uh, change. I'm going to redo this slide. This is, and this is slide 41. This is because um, clouds can really change reflectance, which ultimately really alter your assessment of burn severity. Um, Here's another example in which you have clouds surrounding everywhere. It's possible in this image if a fire occurred maybe in the south end, you might be able to get a good image for the for a, for a fire that occurred here. But for the remainder of the image, it's really not a good image. Um, and that's also because of the snow in the mountains. You should always be a little bit uh, wary of clouds, even these kind of um, hazy clouds, again, the edge cloud shadows. They really can alter the um, reflections of the imagery. And again, you should be careful not to have haze in the imagery. Um, it may not show up very well, but if, when you difference the images um, to create a different snow like burn ratio image, um, it may look very different because of this haze. And finally, again, make sure you don't have snow within the fire perimeter. It's going to change the, imagery, uh, the image spectrally and will result in very different burn severity values. I suppose another way to deal with limited snow would be to mask it out. Um, so you could still use the same image, but then you'd also have to make sure that the other image pair kind of match phenologically, and that can be difficult um, during the winter. You also make sure that there's no active burning within the, within the fire perimeter. Again, you might get some smoke or shadows, and you'll get this active fire line, which really changes um, the burn severity values. You should also be careful to see that the fire scars, maybe a little fire here and here, that um, they're not near the near the scene edge, so the actual landsat scene edge. And this is because they get kind of cut off and you get these patterns that are um, not resulting from fire. These are just um, artifacts that are the result of being near the scene edge of the landsat scene. And you should also be careful, and this may or may not be possible, depending on your image availability. But it's nice to try to get, this is the lens that's seven seen, so you can see these scan line artifacts, these data gaps within the image. Um, they extend on either side of the center of the image. So in the center of the image, you can get a uh, scan line pre um, image. However, when you get towards the edges, you start to get, again, scan gaps or data gaps. And so these can really start to alter um, fire scars. And if it's a small fire, um, it may take up a scan gap, could take up a lot of the fire scar. So, you know, when possible, try not to use um, imagery with data gaps. Um, and this isn't always possible. And so there's way, we generally just mask out the image, um, the uh, image data gaps and map the fire scar the way it is. And that may be what you have to do, but you should be careful again with these data gaps. Let's talk about the fire mapping. And I'll just kind of talk about how we actually pick scenes 
to monitor fire, let's talk about the uh, fire mapping tool. The fire mapping tool was originally developed in the United States to kind of supplement the mines and trends and burn severity project. Now, mines and trends and burn severity project map a lot of fires every year in the in the U.S. They map about 95% of the acreage. So they map, you know, generally over a thousand fires a year. The problem when you the problem is when you look at, for example, the 2016 fire occurrence occurrences within the U.S. And most of these are going to be small fires, and they kind of look like the entire South is southern United States is burning. But this is just an artifact of these just being points and not actual probably um, not actually primitives of the fires. What you see is that there's lots and lots of fires that go unaccounted for. And so MTBS maps again 95% of the fire acreage, but misses you know 99 and a half uh, percent of the fires some years uh, up to you know they miss they may only map two percent of the fires. So MTBS doesn't map um, these small fires just because it's it's cost prohibitive and just can't be done. And it's not always good records for all these fires as well. So the fire mapping tool was developed with an eye to actually um, hopefully give users um, tools to more accurately map burn perimeters and severity with land chain imagery and use similar techniques to the Mines and Tens Burn Severity Project. Um, the big difference between the Mines and Tens Burn Severity Project and the tools that we use is that for the fire mapping tool, we actually use QGIS. And the reason we use QGIS is because it's open source um, and can be used anywhere in the world. Whereas some of the tools that uh, MTBS uses can be, um, have fees associated with them, and can be cost prohibitive. Um, and so we want to make sure that we can get the tool out to anyone. So this is the plug-in, the fire mapping tool. You can see it, see it on the right-hand corner of the screen right here. Um, it just has a drop-down menu, like a lot of other plugins within QGIS. So it's in the, kind of the same framework. And the FMT will allow users to actually process landscape imagery that have been ordered through the Aero Science Processing and Architecture System. The reason we have uh, SPA processed these data sources is because it does the top of atmosphere corrections. They can also do surface reflectance corrections, even though um, generally uh, we've been using top of atmospheres because that's what monitoring burn severity is used, and we're more familiar with the potential um, burn severity breakpoints with top of atmosphere corrected data. <clears throat> you can the FMT will take a pre-fire and a post fire image and create a DMBR uh, image. Um, the FMT will also allow users to actually map fire perimeters and potentially uh, create ma masking shape files to map out potential image anomaly, uh, anomalies such as water, clouds. Um, it also will calculate automatically calculate an RDBR offset and subsequently create an RDBR image. Now, um, it also allows users to input their own, so the tool offers Suggestion since it's the RDBR offset. They're not, um, I wouldn't say that any, that the value put into the tool is necessarily perfect, but it's a good first guess. Um, it also suggests potential low, modern, high burn severity thresholds. Um, and again, this is even potentially more problematic than RDBR offset. Um, these breakpoints are estimated based on the spectral characteristics of the imagery. Um, I'm not going to go into detail right now on how that's done. But the point is, is they're just estimates. And so uh, really, you should, should be familiar with the um, area to make sure those uh, estimates even make sense and actually start to visual, visually threshold the uh, imagery themselves. Um, subsequently, the FMT will create a threshold burn severity product and output metadata that uh, defines a lot of the def uh, characteristics about that fire mapping product. And all the information that was used to create it. Um, and finally, all this information that's been entered into the um, FMT is databases in a spatial light database. And so this allows you to do spatial queries, to actually query a database um, about, the, about the fires you've actually mapped. Um, and finally, um, even though we're going to go, in, to go through the Workshop exercise today. Um, there's also 
additional documentation um, at mtbs.gov, at qjs-fire-mapping-tool. Um, there's actually another ex similar exercise in there. Um, but it also has a little more detail about how to pick images and some of the things that we do when mapping fires um, as part of my Sins of Inventory Project. So I just want to give you a really brief overview of um, how what the FMT actually does and how you can actually use the FMT to map a fire. So the first thing you can do is figure out geographically with an imagery or any other sort of data source, figure out where a sensor um, may essentially may have detected a fire, or potentially you have a lat long. So if you have a lat long, you know geospatially where the fire might have occurred. You can enter this information into the QGIS tool. And really what you're going to need to enter in is going to be um, a lat long, so the location. It can be a centroid of a fire, um, the, the date of the fire. And then by entering in some imagery, um, image date information, you can actually use the tool to query the Landshed Archive to get a list of potential images that could then be uh, uploaded to ESPA. And once you uh, once ESPA has finished processing those images, you can then download those images and bring them into the FMT to identify a pre, which is this left-hand image, and a post-fire image. Um, you can then difference the images to create different snow-wise burn ratio, um, physically trace the fire perimeter, and this is within QGIS, and then use the FMT to threshold the imagery and create a burn severity product. So it's just kind of a general simplified outline of what we're going to be talking about today. So in conclusion, um, remote sensing of burn severity is definitely possible. Um, the accuracy and how well of how well you do with mapping is kind of up to you and up to how much information you have about the fire and how fires in your area may burn. Um, but at least, at the very least, you can get a really nice perimeter out of it um, to show where the fire burned. Again, on the on the ground, burn spread information can really help help you calibrate and figure out how fires burn in your area. Um, it can help you um, potentially determine what the breakpoint should be. But again, the tool will allow you to it, it actually will estimate and suggest breakpoints if you don't even really if you just don't have an idea of where you should start. Um, the pre and the post fire image characteristics are really important when mapping fires. Um, you should always take into account whether you want to perform an initial versus an extended assessment, um, whether there's seasonal variation between the imagery image, and this can be this can result from um, just uh, changes between dormant and growing season. It can be uh, it can result from droughts. It can result from flooding. And there's all sorts of um, things that occur during the time of that affect vegetation, which can uh, subsequently affect the imagery. And finally, just you know, be aware that there are potential image anomalies. It could be um, it's possible that burned area was subsequently harvested, and this would definitely change um, burn severity assessments. It's possible that you have agricultural areas in your um, burned area, so you should be aware that they're there and potentially mask them out if you don't have any other images that are available that don't contain those anomalies. Um, the FMT can use Landsat 5, 7, and 8 images, so <coughs> any fire between, um, I, I shouldn't say any, but most fires between 1984 and present can be mapped. Um, and it can be used to assist in the, assist in the mapping of burn severity, or at least used to assess burn severity. Um, and so the next part of this presentation, we're going to demonstrate the fire mapping tool in, the, uh, in its entirety from kind of a start to end in how, how we actually take land imagery and then map burn severity. So now we're going to actually go through the fire mapping tools exercise. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, hold them until the end of the uh, <clears throat> demonstration. Today we're probably going at a pace that may be too quick for you to follow along, but we're, just remember that we're recording this presentation and the presentation will be posted in the next 24 hours. So you'll be able to watch it at your leisure and complete the exercise at that point.
So the first step in the process of this actual exercise is to actually get the fire mapping tool plugged in. You can get that uh, on the MTBS website at www.mtbs.gov. Under the tools drop down menu, you'll see two other drop down menus, I mean, two other applications. One is the QGIS fire mapping tool. And the second is the NDVI profile tool that actually kind of gives you the idea of how Landsat scenes differ through time and space um, within the United States. So again, this isn't, unfortunately, we don't do this for the world, um, but if you are in the U.S., this will allow you to determine if your scenes are uh, similar in terms of greenness. However, you can download the QGIS fire mapping tool, so just click on this link, and you'll get to this download page with a little bit of little bit of explanation, um, a contact form when you, if you have questions, and the download tool and documentation. So you can click on this link, and the tool will download pretty quickly. It is 787 megabytes, and this is because it's got imagery. So depending on the speed of your connection, it might take a little bit of time. Um, this plugin also has um, more documentation that goes along with it. So if you get stuck after looking at the exercise, you can always go back to the documentation. So, okay, so once you've downloaded it, so I downloaded it, you'll wanna just extract it with whatever, with Windows or 7-Zip or whatever you like. So it might take, uh, you know, 10, 15 seconds to extract it depending on your computer. If you look in this folder, you have two different folders, and I'll show you where to put these. You also have the user guide, and this is the first version, so um, if you have any questions, please let me know. But uh, the FMT, this is the actual QGIS plugin. If you look in here, there's a lot of different um, Python files, there's an SQLite file, there's some other, there's an uh, init script, um, some, a config script that you'll need to edit. We also have the fire mapping QGIS folder, and this is the folder that kind of contains all the folders necessary um, for mapping a fire. So, to get the plugin installed, the first thing you want to do is copy the FMT folder and paste it um, into your users. In this case, mine is JPCOT. Um, dot QGIS2, uh, Python, plugins, folders. So you can see I've already copied it in here. Um, this is where all, you, this is, <coughs> depending on where, how you set up uh, QGIS, this could be under C users. In this setup, it's under D users. So copy and paste it right there. So um, we're almost done with getting that set up. You also need to configure your um, uh, config file, and this just has some paths you'll have to change. Um, one thing will be your image source folder. So you'll see this fire mapping QGIS folder um, reference right here. And so you just want to make sure that wherever you put this, that that part of the path goes before image source land set, um, and this part of the path ends with fire mapping QGIS for the scene directory. Um, the other two are uh, the NDBI URL is fine, but uh, it, again, it won't be that useful to use it outside the US. And the ESPA folder is, uh, you don't necessarily have to do anything with this. We're not really using this right now. We just left it uh, in case you wanted to define it. So the definitely need to change the image source and scene di directory. Uh, Again, make sure you put where the fire mapping QGIS folder ultimately lands. So on my machine, I put my fire mapping QGIS folder directly on my D drive. Um, again, you can put it wherever you want. Just make sure you list, you reference where you put it. Um, if you copy and paste it directly, you should have all these folders. You also have um, uh, Tower GZ folder, and this is where your, um, this is where the imagery for this exercise will be housed in Tower GZ for, form. This is the, uh, this is the direct download from ESPA. All that information goes right here. Um, 
you also have the event prod. This is where your fire mappings are going to go. The image process, uh, image, uh, sorry, image source, which is where the lab set imagery goes, including the reflectance and MBR, um, and image proc folders. The other, for example, the working directory is just where your, uh, a lot of this processing takes place. There's a template folder for QGIS templates. Um, and in scene list is if you want to keep track of what scene list you submit to ESPA. Um, and RSS just keeps track of the ESPA RSS file. Okay. So now if you've been following along, if you put the FMT um, folder into the, into the correct location on your machine, you should be able to go to the plugins directory. Um, you'll notice that mine's already installed, but what you would do is go to the plugins, go to manage and install plugins. It might take a second to load up. If you put it in the correct location, you should be able to search for it. You should be able to say fire mapping tool or FMT. And you want to check this box. It should be, if everything is uh, installed correctly, then you'll be ready to go with the FMT. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that there's one additional, um, there's one additional plugin you may you'll want to potentially get. Um, it's called the Zonal Stats plugin. So what you should do is search Zonal. You put in Zonal. It should come up with a Zonal Stats plugin. Download it. Um, uh, install it. And you'll be good to go. And we use that as a tool to get the RDMDR offset, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Okay, so now we'll pretend that you've actually uh, installed everything correctly. Hopefully you have. Hopefully that wasn't too difficult. Um, so as I mentioned before, we're going to you know make sure you, you edit the configuration file. And now we can actually go into the QGIS um, file and actually uh, establish the link to the uh, SQLite database. So to do that, um, and I, I didn't point that out before, let me show you where that is. Um, So again, it's in the FMT folder. You'll see it's all all alphabetical. All You'll see um, a file called the uh, Fire Info SQL Lite. So what you'll do, make sure you can copy and paste this address. So you'll go up to Layer, Add Layer, Add Spatial Light Layer. Now you can click on new. Okay, and it'll ask you where your file is. So you can see it'll come up with your SQLite file. You hit open. And then you can hit connect. And you should just be able to edit it. Yeah, you can just connect, it's not a problem. And then you can close. So you've already made your connection to spatial light layer. So now we're actually going to talk about how we actually use the ESPA, um, uh, ESPA created data file. Um, so we kind of have to pretend that you submitted an order to ESPA. Um, you can submit an order by submitting a text file with Landsat scene IDs. Um, if we open the FMT, you can do this a couple different ways. Well, one way. You can get, hit get scene list, and what this is going to ask you is for latitude and longitude, so you're going to those in. You then set the time frame that you want seen, um, and you basically hit OK. What it's going to do is it's going to re return a text file. It'll tell you, you'll be asked where to, you want to save it, and you can then submit this, uh, this 
table to ESPA and then download the PubGG file. So you can see that uh, I didn't submit a scene list. Uh, I didn't get one, so that's all right. Once you actually have downloaded the ESPA scenes, you put them into, let's look at the folder you put them into. Again, you put them into the PubGG folder. Um, it would go in there. We'll pretend that you've already done this. I'm not going to run through it because it can take your system several minutes to process them. Um, if you've got them from ESPA, once you get those targeted Z files, you're going to put them in the folder and get process ESPA data. If I hit this right now, it's going to give me an error, but we'll pretend that um, I actually have uh, data in there. So I'll hit process ESPA data. It's then going to ask you if um, you want to actually output the files in Albert's equal area projection. So if you're within the U.S. and want the coterminous uh, projection, Albert's equal area, you can hit yes. Otherwise, hit no, and that means that the projection of your Landsat imagery will be in uh, whatever UTM zone that you downloaded. Um, and in this case, it's uh, zone 10 for the data for this for the file we're going to be talking on in just a minute. Okay, so again, we'll keep pretending that we process the, we process the imagery right now. So now you actually, we'll actually go through the step-by-step -step process of how to enter in the fire information um, and how to actually process uh, the fire, including making the perimeter and threshold in the image. So if you didn't, um, if you if you didn't have the fire added to this database, what we would do is hit add fire. You would then enter in a state. In this case, if you're an international user, you're not a state, so you're an international. What it's gonna do is just take the first two letters and just say all the files files will get back to IN. You would enter in the latitude longitude, the ignition date of the fire, whether or not it's a wildfire, prescribed fire, wildfire land use fire, unknown other, uh that's my address, select one that best describe your fire. You can enter in the acreage or not if you don't know it, just leave the 999s. Um, and this is important. Uh, you then would want to also enter in the path and the row for the um, actual uh, landsat scenes you're going to use. So if you look at, we'll just, I'll show you that really briefly. So if you look at Go to a folder that has some Tarji Z folders. I mean, files. Oops, um, so, again, if you look at these file names, what you'll see, we're going to go through this really briefly. You'll see a series of letters and numbers. The first two letters are kind of a sensor ID. So, LC is for OLI, Lancet A, LE is for um, Enhanced Thematic Mapper, TM is for, uh, TM is for um, Thematic Mapper, 08 is the sensor, Lancet A, 07 is the sensor. And then you have a, then you have a 0, 4, 7. So this is path 0, 4, 7, so it's three digit code. So make sure when you, if you entered in these, you put in a three digit code or, um, and depending on your area, you could have uh, it could be uh, it could be over 100 for the path. And the next three digits after that are the rows. In this case, it's path row 027, so 27. The other th other fields you can enter in um, for a fire are the actual name of the fire, the containment date, report date, all this uh, comment, agency, um, administration, you know, whatever you want. It is helpful, I would say out of these, the most helpful one to put in is the event name. Um, in this case, if you were mapping uh, the fire we're talking about today, we type in the Paradise Fire. Um, but it's already added for you. So instead, go to search. This is if you already have a fire added to the database. Search my name, I'm gonna type in Paradise Search, and you'll see a fire come up. Now you'll probably um, you'll probably see some mappings. So you, there's some example mappings that I've included in yours. But the really, if you just enter this information in, this would all be blank. Um, 
but this would be filled in because this is all the information you would have added to the Paradise Fire. Uh, that in this case, it would it would have been incomplete, but I've mapped this several times. It says complete acreage is 2,800 uh, 2, 2, acres. Um, the event date was 6 15 2015. Here's the event ID, which is automatically generated for you. Again, it's the first two letters of the state, or if you're an international uh, user, the IN. Um, and then it has information about the latitude and longitude, the year and the year of the uh, occurrence. Then we have the path row that you entered in. It shows up as two digit, but is actually again a three digit code. Latitude and longitude, and then the ID this is the first fire that has been mapped. Now, we'll pretend again that we process this for data. We click this, hit no when it asks you for elders. So what should have happened is you should have had land tap scenes created. So if you click on what you're going to do is you're going to double click inside this um, fire, this area right here, and a, uh, a window will come up that allows you to select the type of data. So collection data, there's no other option. Um, we used to have a different type of data. That's kind of a remnant, but it'll allow you to uh, select the start year. So the reason this is important is because the tool allows you to load all the imagery that you have between a start year and an end year for this path row, path row 4727. So you'd select 2014. End year is 2016. And you hit OK. And the tool will tell you the number of images that have loaded into QGIS. So you hit OK. So let's look at QGIS now. So if you look at QGIS and it might take a, a second for the imagery to load. You'll see two images. You'll see, in this case, if you only provide you with two images, you'll see the post fire, the Lancet 7 scene on top, and the pre fire image. And the images range in date from lowest, uh, sorry, the, the um, first image, from the first image date all the way up to the last image date. So you can see we have two images. And let's check the projection information and make sure that it's what we think it should be, which is if you go to general. So what you're going to do is right click on an image, go to properties, go to general, and look right here. Here's what the image references. And this should automatically be populated. You should be good. But the EPSG G code is 32610. Uh, and the projection is, or projection data, is W84, UTM, zone 10. So that should all be loaded for you. So it should be good. Now that we've loaded the imagery, we can actually start to um, create a new fire mapping. So the reason this imagery loads into the tool, so you can look at it, but it does another nice thing, which is um, when you want to actually create a new mapping, this information of any Landsat scene that's in here, any Landsat scene, even if it's in a different projection, even if it's not related, it's all going to load into the fire mapping tool when you when you hit create new map mapping. So if you have Landsat scenes in here, this tool is going to be able to read them correctly. And I should say, if you process them using the FMT, you have options for an initial, um, initial single scene. This means that you don't have a pre-fire image, you only have a um, post-fire image, and so you do a normal, you assess the fire using a normalized burn Im ratio image. This is discussed in the documentation. We're not going to talk about single scene assessments today. Um, they're a little bit more difficult, and sometimes the information is a little bit more, it's harder to um, uh, explain the different breakpoints, but it is explained in the documentation. Um, so an initial, again, is right after the fire. Extended is one year after, in this case. And we also, again, have an extended assessment single scene. Again, we're not going to talk about that. Um, so we're going to select extended. You can then select the pre-fire image, um, and that's going to be the Landsat image. You could select either one, but for example, if you select the 2016 as the pre-image and the post-image, you're just going to get zero values for the DMBRs. It's 
to load the same image for both. So you want to select the pre as a Landsat 8 and the post. So the nice thing about this scene is you got the scene ID, it tells you what sensor it's in, and it tells you the actual data image. Um, the perimeter image is if you, let's say you had three or four images, you had another image that you wanted to use to map the fire scar. Maybe the post perimeter you want to use has some areas of clouds that you have to mask out. It doesn't show the fire perimeter exactly, so you use a different image. You can put that image here. You could put, you could replicate. You could say that the Landsat 17 is the perimeter image as well. That's fine. But you can also leave it blank. So this is just, um, Anything that you tell it, so if you put a different image in here, it'll get clipped like everything else to the fire boundary. But for now, we're just going to leave this blank. So save mapping. So what you should see is at the bottom, and yours may be a, I'd be a different number than mine. I, I've played around with this a lot, so I've got more mappings than one or two, whatever is in yours. You'll see this new mapping right here. And it was it was started today at 12:24 p.m. If you look at my time, this is the correct one. I, this was created. Okay. So, if your land, if you had land imagery and it imported in the tool, you should be able to run Fire Scene Prep. What Fire Scene Prep does is it creates a DNVR image. It subtracts the pre-fire and the post-fire values. Um, it's going to be in the same UTM projection as everything else. Everything else should be the same. So you can hit run scene prep. If, um, in this case, I've already run it, it's gonna take you a couple minutes to run it, you'll get a warning message that says it already exists. Um, you can hit okay. Let's say that you made it before, you, you ran scene prep before, but you had a different projection, and you wanna change it. I, I mean, you, you, let's say that I had done it, which I did originally in Elbers. I could actually rerun the imagery and hit overwrite right here, and it would redo, um, Scene prep when I when I run when I um, hit this button. I'm not going to do that because um, the DMBR image is good. We should be all right to go. So pretend that I hit run scene prep. Okay, so we should be good to go. The next thing you want to hit is run fire prep. What fire? I'll show you exactly what fire prep does. So let's hit fire prep. Run fire prep. Let's see, it says scene prep complete, run fire prep. Fire prep is complete. So just hit OK. What fire prep does is it creates a, um, and I'll show you what this is right now. If you hit this button, open event folder, what it should have done is create a new folder. Um, and let's take a look at the contents of this folder for just a second. It has a QJS file, which is the project folder. Oh, not folder, sorry, the project file that goes to QGS. It has a burn boundary shape file and a mask, and that's all that's in this right now. So we're going to add to this, and uh, automatically, um, we're going to add to the shape file and add, automatically cut, uh, get the imagery in there. So now what you, now what you would want to do is hit delineate perimeter. So delineate perimeter. QGIS project files are located, are loaded. So again, if you looked in your project folder, it's going to load the QGS folder, load everything from there in there. And it's going to probably give you a message saying that the project file is old, from an older version of QGIS. It, that's fine, it's not really an error, it's, it'll still work. It'll load the full scenes from that path row, and it will also load the shape file for the burned area boundary, the mask, the post scene, and the pre-scene imagery. So now what we're going to do is we're going to, the first thing you want to do is right click on any of the images, including the post fire scene that's clicked and say, zoom to this layer. If you zoom to this layer, you'll see the, uh, you'll see the, <coughs> excuse me, you'll see the image, I hope you'll load, it looks pretty good, it's probably not 100% per, uh, perfect, but we're going to change it, make it a little bit brighter. So what we're gonna do is zoom into the fire, if you look at this bright patch of pixels right here, this is just slightly different, more slight speckle variation because of uh, snow. The fire scar is right below it. So here's, let's zoom back out so you can see where that was right here. And zoom back in and see the fire scar right here. Well, right now the fire scar, we're gonna zoom in the fire scar right here. 
I'm zooming in by using the plus magnifying glass right here. I want to zoom out a little bit. This guy zoomed a little bit too closely. Get the negative. Um, you can see the fire scar right here, but it's not showing up as well as we probably like. So what you can do is you can actually change the way the, the actual style of the uh, of the actual image. So what you would do is go uh, again, right click on the post fire reflectance, go to properties, go to style, render type multi band. That's what you want. There's other choices here like single band pseudo color. We're going to use single band through the color a little bit later, but right now multi-band color is good. And I should have the correct bands loaded. You could change the min and the max values. Often we start out with zero to 127, zero to one. The numbers are going to, they're eight bit images. That means they're going to range to 250, um, the values can range to 255. So they're um, 256 different potential numbers ranging from zero to 255 for each reflectance image. We can do a little bit of enhancement to make it a little bit brighter. We can clip it to min and max. And all I have to do is hit uh, apply. Let's close out of here. What you should see is the image looks considerably brighter. So you can change any of those numbers I just showed you to whatever you want. And it's going to alter how the image shows up. It changes how, it changes the ratio um, of um, reflectance values used in the RGB, uh, red, green, and blue bands of this multi-band image. So we've done the post. We want to do the same to the pre. You can see the pre is kind of dark. Now that, you know, we'd probably like to be a little bit more similar to the post fire image. So we can click on pre-fire scene. If you want to see it, click the X box. Uh, hit right, uh, right click on the image name, go to properties. Again, it's multi-band color. We've got bands in this case, seven, five, and four. So the bands are showing correctly. It's different than the other one because lands at eight versus lands at seven. But you can still put in the same numbers, zero and one twenty-seven for the min and max values it's going to look at. Uh, go to stretch and clip them in max. Apply. There we go, okay. Okay, so if we flicker, we just go back and forth between these. They look more similar, but you'll see the fire scar disappear when you go to the pre-fire image. But the greenness of the images looks to be fairly similar um, visually right now. So looks pretty good. Okay, so now we're actually going to assess the burn scar. So you can, again, you may want to zoom in a little bit more. Oops. Zoom in, not zoom out. Um, so I've zoomed in. I'm ready to edit the burned area boundary. So often what I'll do is I will look at both the post-fire scenes, and as you can see things you can't see. In the DNBR, so you can see the fire scar nicely in the DNBR. Should show up pretty well. Um, if it doesn't, you can adjust the DNBR a little bit. And I'll go through why we do that in a second. But you may, I, the values we suggest are fine, um, so it should load pretty well. You also see a post fire MBR. You should be able to see the fire scene pretty well on that. But again, I kind of like using the post fire reflectance image to trace the fire scar. So I'm going to click on, and you can X the box by the burned area boundary. Nothing shows up because you haven't done anything to it yet. You're going to go up to this pencil, um, which is the editing feature for shape file. Just click on it. You see this uh, kind of this star by this polygon shape. You then click on add feature. It's the add feature button. And what that's going to do is allow you to Create a shape, uh, add vertices to a shape, a polygon for um, that will allow you to trace the fire scar. So you if you click on it once, you see this line pop up. Click on it twice, and you start seeing this polygon grow. 
if you cross over something like this, you're going to get an error message because you can't have our seats cross over. But as long as you don't click when you do that, so like if I, that one's still okay. That's all right. You may see some error messages pop up at the top, but as long as the error message goes away, you're good. Otherwise, you may need to edit your shape files so the vertices don't cross. So uh, I'm kind of doing a sloppy job. Again, it's up to you how nicely you want your fire perimeter to be. Um, so the accuracy is really, let's see. So it looks like I made a mistake somewhere. Anyway, when I'm done, I'm going to right click and I'm going to hit enter in one for the ID. It's telling me that I actually crossed the vertice, which is, is that true? Uh, not seeing it. You can zoom in to check your vertices. If you want to check your vertices, zoom in. You can see um, all the X's. Those X's indicate areas where you drop the vertice. Um, I don't see any problems. Okay, so I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Hopefully there aren't any problems. We'll find out. And then if you're done editing and you're happy with it, you can hit save. The other thing you could do is if I mess up uh, vertices, I could hit this button, which is the node tool. So you click on a node, you can click on individual nodes and delete them or add additional nodes. So let's just say that I went in here and I didn't want to have that vertice right there. So I click on my node tool. Well, it's like a hammer and a, um, I don't know, a screwdriver or something in a node. Click it on. If I want to get rid of that one, I can hit delete. And that deleted it, so it's fine. So I edited it, and then come back up here, save my edit, um, zoom back out, oops, uh, and then click on my shape. Looks like I'm, I've saved it, so I'm okay. So make sure you click on save, the save button, not this one. This is the project save. This is the vector file save. If you click on the pencil, you're done editing. So that looks pretty good. Um, you could then also save your project. So it just saves it as that project ID, that WA4769812 and so on. If you want, you can also digitize you can mask out problem areas. So just for fun, I'm gonna mask out this cloud shadow. So again, I'll do the exact same thing. I click on the mask, pencil, edit, with the editing tool. I right click and hit one. Okay, and I usually just number them. If I had more than one, I'd go one through whatever number of uh, masks I would do. Click on your mask, hit save. And then click the editing tool to stop editing. And you should be good. So if you look, now you have a mask. Even though it's outside the fire printer, we didn't really need to mask it, but yeah, it's fine. The tool will automatically mask these um, no data scan gap lines. So you don't need to do that. Um, and now we're ready to actually subset the imagery. What I mean by subset is the tool is going to look at the bounding box of this shape file. So there's going to be four corners. It's a rectangle. And um, this designates the area in which this uh, uh, polygon occupies in space. Let's go back to the FMT, FMT tool. Let's open up the event tool again. See, again, this stuff has changed. The shapes have changed. Just, you know, the polygon is slightly bigger. They're not that big. Um, you can now put subset, and what it says is running subset, and then it says subset is complete. Okay, well, that's good. Now, if you want to see what actually was done, you can come into this folder, which is a subset folder. Not the subset folder, sorry, the actual event folder. And what you'll see is the imagery has been created that shows the actual footprint of the fire, just a binary image. Uh, DMVR image has been clipped. Uh, gap mask has been created for Landsat 7. Got a mask of, uh, that's the mask. That's actually got the um, 
masks that we created in uh, binary form, zero for not mask, one for mask. Reflectance imagery has been clipped, and VR imagery has been clipped. Again, we have a gap mask file. So we should be pretty good to go. So now we're about ready to actually calculate the DVR offset. So one thing I want to point here is if, if you feel pretty good about your perimeter, click, you can click high. You can then make notes like this is a test. And if you click OK, it's going to attribute the shape file with area and with some of these comments. Now, down here, this is for the RDBR offset. The tool, again, calculates off the entire kind of bounding box, but the entire footprint of the imagery. It calculates um, the median value of all um, DMBR values within the range from negative 100 to 100. Um, and so the, the me median value is 3, and the offset, which is uh, standard deviation, is calculated as well, and that's 37. And the analysis type we're going to do today is DMBR, not MBR, and DBI. So the tool will then allow you to create an RDMBR image. Now, if you're, if you're not sure that this RDMBR value is very good, and we're not positive it's good, we can then actually go back into the um, FMT and actually calculate the DMBR offset. So what we're going to do is, we don't need mask on right now, we need burned area boundary on right now. We actually want to look at the DMBR image. DMBR image looks like this. And so what we want to do is we want to, we want to highlight unburned Areas of the same vegetation, about the same vegetation type, same vegetation greenness, uh, between, uh, that are outside the fire perimeter. So this would be the same vegetation type, but probably conifers or some of shrubs, so it's also kind of outside. I've noticed that if I, when I create this polygon, if I cross over into these no data values, um, that this alters the distribution of the mean, the median values. So just try to click on areas that we're going to just select polygons within uh, areas of good data. And so what we're going to do is we're going to now create a new shape file from which to get the DMBR value. And again, you don't necessarily need to do this every time. The tool suggests one for you, but just so you know how to, on, I mean, how to do it manually. You get new shape file layer. Okay. To allow you to pick between a point, a line, or a polygon, we're going to pick polygon. Now, one thing that's important is you need to make sure you select the right UTM, uh, the right UTM zone. So we're going to go click on this icon next to support select zero. It's going to give you a list if you know what your imagery is in. In this case, it's WGSA4 UTM zone 10 or EPSG32610. You can search for this. We can put in WGS84 slash UTM, oops, and then we could look for what zone we want, so we're 10 north. So we're good, hit OK. Um, new field, just enter a new name, I should say DMBR, DMBR offset, OK, and it's going to ask you where you want to save it. So you're going to want to save it in the same project, which is actually for me, it's the uh, MTBS number nine folder, so this one. And I'm going to call it DNBR offset. So save. Okay, so you got an empty shape file. You're then going to edit it like you did with the burn boundary. But again, just select pixel values you want, select thousands of them. When you're done, right click, and ask you for an ID, just hit one or whatever you want. You can see this offset shape. I'm good, so I'm gonna save it, stop editing. Now I'm going to actually use the zonal statistics tool. I'm going to go into, if you've uh, installed the zonal statistics tool, tool correctly in the plugin, go to raster, zonal statistics, zonal statistics. Now, it's going to ask what raster layer you wanna look at. You're going to wanna look at the post scene, the MBR. You want band one, there's only one band. DMBR offset, make sure you select the right shape file. Don't select burn boundary or mask. 
and they can select what statistics you want. So I'm going to select the count. Count will give you how many pixels you're selecting. Mean, median, standard deviation, not to worry about minimum, maximum, range, or any of those. You could select them if you want. Um, you just can use this information to help populate the FMT. I hit, hit OK. So if you right click on the DVR offset shape file, go to attribute table. You can then see the count. So I selected 2,295 pixels. Mean, my offset was 21. My standard deviation was close to 40. As long as your standard deviation is under 50 or so, should be good. As long as your off, your um, mean, or I usually use median to get rid of um, outliers, but their mean and median in this case are really similar because there don't really aren't many outliers. This case is 21. As long as those are under 50, you're probably good to go. That just means that there's not a lot of variation in your unburned areas, so it's around zero. In this case, your DMBR offset was three. So ours is slightly different, and that's okay. So you could either say, well, three's pretty good. They're pretty close. The standard deviation of 20 and three, that's, yeah, that's close. Um, I would say that my the one that the tool selects is pretty good. The tool selects all pixels that are unburned within that image, so it's selecting more pixels. I'd probably just go with this one. So three and thirty-seven. Um, you can then hit the RDMBR button, and that will create your RDMBR image. So it should say at the bottom of the um, QGIS tool RDMBR complete. So we're good. If we open up our work folder, we can see that. The DMBR image is there, and so is the RDMBR image. Good. So you've got your DMBR and RDMBR. Good to go. Okay. So today we're going to stop at section two um, because that's all we have time for. Um, but next week we will finish up the threshold exercise, um, which starts at step three. Uh, and, I'll, and I'm going to pass this back to Cindy. Thanks, Josh, for a really awesome presentation. I want to remind you that we'll open it up for uh, questions right now if you, if you have any, or you can email Josh at the email address shown here. I also want to remind you that if you have any questions um, about uh, land management or wildfire webinars, you can contact me at the address at my email address here or my colleague Amber McCullum. If you have general RSET questions, you can contact um, Anna Prados, the lead for RSET. And of course, for access to the recordings that Josh just mentioned, as well as the homework and the exercises, you can go to our website listed here. So we'll pause for questions, um, but we want to thank you all for participating this week. Next week, we will be doing the second half of the fire management tool with uh, Josh um, in QGIS, and then we will follow that by some information about the Global Wildfire Information System. Thanks, everyone. All right, everyone, so hopefully you can see the question screen right now. I'm going to scroll to the top of it where it says question and answer session. And we'll go through each question one by one. You can see that Josh has already um, responded to some of the questions. And Josh, you may just want to go over um, each question verbally and the answers as well and you can and uh, and I can just scroll down as you go through them you can do a summary summary of each question if you'd like sure I can do that no problem um, so the first question is are there set values for those thresholds in the tool and the answer is no there's no set thresholds the tool actually examines um, the DMBR MBR values all the values that are in the um, it's kind of a bounding box around the fire that are within that clipped image and sets them based on the values in the image. Um, I'm not gonna go through the full process and how that's done. Um, it's clearly documented within the actual Python scripts in the tool. Um, if you 
are used to working in Python, you could potentially edit them. But right now, no, there's no um, there's no set values. Uh, question number two is is DMBR equivalent to the difference in NBR? And so yes, DMBR is the difference between the pre and post fire NBR images. Um, question number three. Can we consider 5% variations in NDVI? Um, and so, yeah, if the uh, pre and post fire images differ by greater than 5%, um, and in all honesty, that it could be as greater than 4%, um, then the image pairs really, really don't match. You only want 1% or 2% variation. Um, generally, you only want NDVI values. Um, when you're examining NDVI values, you just want to look at that fluctuation um, in the vegetation type you're examining. Um, so for example, uh, evergreen trees might show a lot less phenologic variation than the deciduous trees that are adjacent to them. So if you're looking at evergreen trees, um, NDVI values that change a lot for those deciduous trees wouldn't really matter as much. Um, the reason we put these values in here is because within the US, we actually do calculate NDVI per vegetation type per scenes. Um, there's actually a link on the MTBS website that will get you to that information. Um, unfortunately, outside the U.S., we don't have that information. Um, so for question number four, do you have any burning situations in sugarcane plantations? The answer is yes. Um, in South Florida and some places of Louisiana, they do burn sugarcane plantations. Um, these are, can be difficult to map because of the really big changes in um, uh, between scene values in agriculture areas, and this can be due to burning, or it could be due because of harvest, or it could be due to drought, or um, well, so there's sorts of, there's all sorts of problems that don't relate to burn, and so I'd recommend um, if you're going to try to map um, map them, just make sure you know exactly where the fires occurred. Um, in the U.S., generally, ag fields are uh, poly, I mean, they're usually um, rectangles, and so if you know one field burn, you can usually kind of map the fire pretty well. Um, I would definitely not map burn severity with sugarcane fields, though, because, um, you know, what is severity in a sugarcane field? Generally, if it burns, it's going to probably burn pretty completely, and so you're not going to get really different levels of severity. You might get, the only thing you can really pick up are differences between burned and unburned areas. So if you're using FMT to map the uh, map fire and sugarcane fields. I would just delineate a burned and unburned. I mean, a, and a burned and unburned threshold or low severity threshold. Uh, question number five: Does this plug in along with QGIS two? Um, short answer is yes, and that's because QGIS between QGIS two and three, they switch versions of Python, and right now it's written to work with Python two, which is with QGIS two. Um, if so, will one create, be created to work with QGIS 3? Um, the short answer is we hope so. Um, we'd like to modify the tool. We have to modify all the Python scripts and potentially some other things to work with Python 3. Um, right now, I don't have a good timeline for when this work's going to be done. Um, but if you already have QGIS 3 um, and install your computer, you can always install QGIS 2 as well and then use the plugin to uh, map your fires that way. Question number six, how do I differentiate burn scar area and burned area in respect to di uh, digital number value? Um, I don't have a good answer for that. I don't know. It's hard to differentiate between um, burned areas and bare areas because a fire essentially burns all up, could potentially burn all of the vegetation away, leaving only burned area, burned soil which would theoretically have similar reflectance values to the surrounding bare soil. And that's if there's no, if you can't see a lot of ash or char on the ground, then spectrally they might be really similar. Um, I don't really have a good break point for that, um, for the digital number to actually differentiate between the two. So you kind of have to look at the imagery and hopefully you'll be able to see, you can always look at um, an area that shows where the vegetation actually was before the fire. and you should be able to hopefully differentiate burned versus unburned area by comparing the two. Um, the other thing is that if you look at a difference normalized burn ratio image, if an area was uh, bare before the fire and after the fire, its value should theoretically be zero or close to zero. 
And so by looking at difference in normalized burn ratio image, you should be able to tell um, areas that were burned that may be bare now um, because they weren't, they made, they probably weren't bare before the fire. Question number seven, could you please repeat how to change config file for the FMT? Um, the short answer is you can, you just have to edit it within a text file editor. Um, directions are provided with the with the uh, exercise or within the recording. Um, so I'm not really sharing my screen right now, but I can, uh, so you should be able to go back and look at how to edit it pretty easily. Um, question number eight, does the Q, uh, FMT work with QGIS 3? Again, no, it, it, it doesn't right now, and hopefully we'll enable this, this uh, will enable the tool to work with QJS3 in the future. Question number nine. When estimating the burned area by relating it to the pollutants PM10 and PM2.5, uh, what method can I apply? So you actually have to understand the relationship between the fuel characteristics and the amount of PM10 and PM2.5 released as the fuel is burned. Um, you'd actually probably have to develop relationships between the burn severity classes and PM10, PM2.5, unless you just know how much PM10 is released per square meter or whatever area unit you want to use um, of your burned area, and then you could just, it'd just be a simple relationship. So the short answer is um, all vegetation types differ between, differ between the amount of PM10, PM2.5 they release, and they're often, they differ in the way that they burn, and they also are highly dependent on severity. Um, so I don't really have a good, you have to, I don't have a good uh, hold on um, how they relate always. So you have to develop these relationships yourself. Um, question number 10, uh, this delineate, uh, delineation of burned area can only be processed after obtaining Lancet imagery, or is there any online pro platform that is free and allow the generation of areas affected by forest fire? So the short answer is you can technically copy and paste any predetermined fire perimeter into the shape file um, that's created by the FMT. Let me change that right now. So that's created in the FMT. Um, fire products right now are available worldwide for the MODIS sensor, and you can just go to modis.gsfc.nasa.gov, data, data prod, mod 45, and these will provide some perimeters. Uh, MODIS are going to be coarser, more MODIS uh, drive perimeters are coarser than Landsat, so they may or may not match up perfectly. Um, you could also develop uh, tools to actually classify other imagery types as a burned area. That's been done for a number of other satellites, but um, MODIS right now is uh, one of the big ones that actually does generate fire perimeters. Question 11, with respect to the optical images of Sentinel-2, can the same mapping method be applied? The short answer is yes. Um, we could, except the bands in Sentinel are different than Landsat, and um, you know, there's, <clears throat> so we'd have to modify the tool to work with Sentinel-2 data. And right now it's not configured. And at this point, we don't have a budget to configure it to work with Sentinel-2. It could happen in the future, but right now it's just Landsat. So question number 12, does, does the FMT only work with Landsat imagery? And yeah, the answer is yes, it only works with Landsat imagery. Question 13, is it fine using it outside the US? And the short answer is yes, it is fine to use it outside the US and I've uh, I've done some testing in Brazil and the outputs uh, look good. Now I will also say with that that um, I don't know severity thresholds for Brazil, and so my threshold income have been way off. Um, so you'll really need to know your area and know kind of how the thresholds work for your area. They're also the, they're of course vegetation dependent, and um, obviously the vegetation in Brazil is um, even though they have similar life forms like tree, shrub, and herb, um, spectrally they can be very different. Question 14, it was a little quick. Could we have support for the FM tool, FMT tool? 
Thank you. Um, so there is support. Um, if you go to the website, the MTBS website, where you can download all the information that was provided before, there's a question form, and we've been answering questions as they come in through there as well. So the short answer is yes. Um, and as long, I, I will say, I don't know if there's necessarily support for the modification of the FMT, but if you have questions or um, just need to know how to do something, let me know, and that's not a problem. Um, uh, I'm the one that answers the questions for the FMT support. Question 15, what is the difference between fire severity and burn severity? Okay, so burn severity are the actual physical changes to vegetation, whereas fire severity is often a measure of how hot a fire gets and the amount of heat release. So burn severity is just looking at the actual physical changes to the vegetation soils. Question 16, and I'll just say, you know, I'll, I'll, after this is done, I'll fill out the answers to these questions. Um, please explain about severity level of DMBR range, uh, regrowth minus 500, minus 251, so on and so forth. Okay, so those breaks were uh, determined by um, Key and Benson in 2006 as basically these are what the breakpoints are in forested areas in the western U.S. So they're just like a, they're just a range of, um, but, uh, sorry, they're just the range that correspond with ground control data with um, these breakpoints. Uh, they're not necessarily perfect, they're just a rule of thumb. And again, they work in the U.S., but they work okay in the U.S. for forested ecosystems. How to find threshold if I want to use it in the U.S.? Is there any reference I can look? Um, I would, I would look at. Uh, there's a lot of papers out there that talk about uh, thresholds within the U.S. and describe this well. The um, the first paper that really does this um, and references those breakpoints above is the Key and Benson um, 2016 Landscape Assessment um, Government Technical Report, and I can provide the link to that in my answer. Um, so that's the first that's the first place I would start, and then if you use Google Scholar, you can actually look at the number of times Keen Benson's been cited, and start to look through some of the other papers as well. There's a lot of papers on it. Um, I don't have a plugin folder under Python file and QGIS folder. How do I get around this? Um, well, that's probably because you can install any plugins, and to get around it, you just um, you would type in. Uh, I'm talking about if what the actual name of the file, if it's actual, let me just check really quickly if it, what the name of that actual folder is. Um, you can just basically create a full empty folder in the correct location. I'll tell you what that is in just a second. I, I'm uh, forgetting. And I'll also write this down in my answer in just a second. Just a second. I need to look on a different computer. Um, Josh, I, I think you also have it written in the instructions in the exercise. I believe it's yeah, there as well. Yep, you're right, Cindy. I just wanted to give somebody an answer right now, too. Yeah, but yeah you're totally right. Yeah. It's, in, it's in the exercise, and um, like like uh, so that's definitely a good point. So let me just look at it really quickly. It won't take very long. Right, so just a reminder, everyone, um, while Josh is looking this up, that a lot of these questions that you have about the, the the steps that he went through um, are actually all in the exercise, so make sure you download the exercise and take a look at it, and then maybe go through it at your own pace, since I know um, he went through it kind of quickly on this um, on this webinar today. Yep. So the, the name of the folder is, um, and it goes in the .qgis2, uh, Python. The name of the folder you'd have to create is called just plugins. It's just lowercase p l u g i n s. Um, is severity level fixed for all cases? And no, it changes based on the imagery. Um, no, so that's not. Are the provided Landsat images TOA corrected? The short answer is yes. When you go, and that is in the exercise. When you order them through ESPA, you can select TOA um, correction and download them that way so that you don't have to worry about that. Um, we, uh, the tool could probably work with surface reflectance images. The, the problem is, is that um, we haven't really related. Um, I don't really know what the, if the breakpoints would change that much, but um, the tool is developed specifically to work with TOA imagery, or TOA corrected imagery. 
So many forest fire growth models out there. From that, we can easily predict forest fire direction and spread area by considering so many parameters. Can you kindly clarify the difference or advantage of the FMT to fire growth models? So um, the only advantage is that you're actually mapping a fire scar on the ground. A fire growth model just predicts where the fire is going to spread. It may or may not be accurate. So you could use a fire growth model before the fire if you're trying to predict where it's going to spread. The FMT with them could be used to assess burn severity after the fire. Question 21. In Indian subcontinent today, the biggest issue is crop residual burning stubble. Can the tool be used for this? And the short answer is yes, but again, you have to kind of know where the fires are, and you could use maybe like Modus product or some other product that will show um, act, uh, where there are active hot spots. Um, because if the fields, again, fields harvest versus burn, you're removing vegetation, you're changing the spectral characteristics. So they might look similar, so you just have to be careful when using it. Um, and it's also possible you might be able to develop your own burn models um, to, if you wanted to classify imagery as burned or not burned for um, burned, uh, burning stubble. Question 22, can the FMT tool be used for crop burning issues and its mitigations and what satellite data should we consider the most? So yeah, it, it could be used for uh, crop burning. Um, if you wanted to map all the burn scars by hand, you'd probably want to look at some sort of sensor data that detects hot spots which could be a little bit off I, because a lot of the hotspot data is kind of coarse, 500 meter to 1,000 meter resolution. So if you know approximate locations, you could easily do it. If you don't, then you might have a few problems if, you know, uh, burned areas look similar, again, to harvest areas and crop uh, type. So you, you could use it, um, but you have to be a little bit careful when using it. What are the gaps of pre and post fire for determined fire severity and burn severity? Um, so the gaps, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking maybe that you're talking about the scan gaps, um, and that would be because we used uh, Landsat 7 imagery um, to map the fire, which has data gap issues. Um, otherwise, uh, if you're talking about knowledge gaps, again, the imagery isn't showing fire severity, it's showing burn severity. It's showing the change in vegetation. Question 24, as far as I'm concerned, ecological ecosystem recovery after fire is not always related to severity, drive remote sensing. Are there other methods instead of uh, spectral indices to assess severity? And the short answer is yes, that's true. Um, you know, it could be the amount of rain or the amount, you know, amount of rainfall, or it could be the amount of nutrients available after fire. Um, so uh, most of the methods we look at are spectral in nature. Um, you can also go out on the ground and measure it physically and actually much monitor physical burn severity. But um, so... Yeah, I mean, this tool is specific, specifically related to spectral. Um, if it doesn't work for your area or if it, it just doesn't make sense, then I just wouldn't use the tool. Uh, question 25, is it possible to use some kind of brightness temperature and is there any spectral library for different classification types? So yeah, yes, you could use some kind of brightness temperature probably to delineate the fire scar. The only thing is that with Landsat, the we're looking at the um, uh, we're looking at some of the, excuse me, if we're looking at the thermal products. They tend to saturate pretty quickly, so and they could that saturation can bleed into other pixels. And so I don't necessarily recommend you using it. And it's also only uh, valid when you um, map when a fire when a fire is actually occurring um is there a spectral library for different classification of fire type um i there probably is i'm not necessarily aware of one right now i'm not using other, any other spectral library what happens to the dmbr offset how is this in the tool um, this wasn't really explained well during my demonstration. The DMBR offset is used to create the re relativized difference normalized burn ratio image. Um, the other thing is that the DMBR offset could be used, and this is up to you, if you want to do between fire comparisons, 
you can subtract or add that value. So if it's negative, um, if it's a negative value, you're going to add it, to, uh, actually add the value. If it's it's positive, you'll subtract it. And this allows you to compare uh, compare fires um, that occurred at different times in different places. You're trying to get the um, you know the condition as close to zero for unburned areas as possible. So you would just subtract or add that value to DMBR. Uh, there is no offset value for NBR. Okay. Let's see, are there any other questions right now? Right now, it looks like you've got them all, Josh. We'll, um, we can stay on a little bit more in case anybody has any additional questions. That sounds good. I can definitely answer any of the questions and I'll, and I'll finish completely. I know we just talked through some of these questions, but I'll also finish, um, I'll edit it some more too. Let's see, there's another question. Okay, question, would it be justifiable to do the data processing for forest fire extent severity mapping without conducting field work? Okay, so for forest fire extent, definitely, because you can see the burn scar clearly in the image and there's not, I mean, the pixels are 30 meters, so you might have some error in the perimeter delineation just because of um, pixel size. You also would have some user error, but um, there's not, I haven't seen a lot of problems with ever using fire perimeter data, land for Landsat data, and it's, it's pretty well accepted in the literature. Now, the severity is a different case. Um, if you can somehow tie severity with, um, what's actually, what you're seeing on the ground, then you could do it without conducting a lot of field work. Um, if you want to get more exact breakpoints for the burn severity image, then you probably want to do a regression analysis by conducting, by actually going out, collecting composite burn index data on the ground and relating this to the imagery. And there's a bunch of papers out there that do this. Um, so it's, if, um, but you don't necessarily, Excuse me, if you do see trends, if you do see that, you know, um, a high severity, a high severity pixel as shown by the imagery um, actually is high severity in the ground, then you can use it. Um, so it's it's really up to the user um, and whether or not they can determine if the imagery actually makes sense. The other thing I would want to point, I do want to point out is severity um, with, uh, severity is really defined well for forested areas in the imagery. Shrubs, it's it's okay. Um, you know, it, it may or may not show severity well. And then herbaceous, you really can't get severity out of it very well. So, um, yeah, you you just have to be careful with uh, how you're using the tool to define burn severity, what assumptions you're making. Okay. Can we map the burn severity of soil? Um, so the short answer is, okay, so each each pixel is kind of an amalgamation of all the burn, burn severity responses, including vegetation and soil. So when you map burn severity, you are um, mapping, again, vegetation and kind of soil burn severity. I Again, you would have to determine for your area if the imagery related well, if the, if the burn severity imagery related well to soil burn severity. Um, and it may or may not. It's difficult for me to say. Again, really the imagery reflects vegetation burning um, or vegetation burn severity 
better than probably soil burn severity, even though soil burn severity is kind of included in that analysis. Uh, so in working through the exercise, again, error when using subset. Is there a troubleshooting guide somewhere? The short answer is um, no, but it's possible. If you send me your error messages, I'll try to I'll try to work through them with you. Um, the error messages that come up are Python error messages. Um, so if you're used to working in Python, you'll probably be able to see what the error is um, more easily than if you're uh, not really that familiar with Python. Okay, maybe we'll go for one or two more questions, um, and then we'll we'll close the webinar for today. Okay, sounds good. Uh, next question, can we judge the grade of the fire while monitoring it? Um, I'm not sure if you mean by this, uh, uh, the actual fire effects on the ground. I would wait, you know, we generally do uh, assessments either, up, uh, either right after the fire or <clears throat> with one year after the fire. We generally don't monitor severity while the fire is still burning. Okay, I think at this point we'll uh, turn it back over to Brock and he will bring up um, our email addresses so you can contact us if you have any questions and we can get you um, in touch with Josh, if you have any specific questions about the fire management tool, but we want to thank everyone for joining us today and especially thank Josh um, for giving us a really great webinar. Um, again, we the recording will be available in the next day or so, so I recommend that you go through the exercise yourself at your own pace. Uh, using downloading the exercise in written form and then going through what Josh um, went through. And then if you have questions, you can email us um, at our email addresses here. So just to remind you, next week we'll be finishing up um, with this fire management tool. So Josh will be on for the first part of the webinar next week to to sort of finish up with what we didn't finish today. And then we'll also be um, showing you the global wildfire information system um, for looking at uh, wildfires globally. So thanks everyone again for joining us and we'll look forward to talking with you again next week.